So I'm thrilled to introduce our panel. Um, our topic is portfolio construction in the midst of the world's massive uncertainty. Um, very timely. Um, we have a great panel of experts here, so we'll just dive right in. Um, so why don't we just sort of go through everybody and why don't we start with how are you thinking through how you construct your portfolio amidst these very volatile times. You each have a very specific focus. Um, so Alan, do you want to start with uh, art and how you think through art doing these days? Sure. So thank you everyone uh, for your time. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Alan. I'm the CIO at Masterworks. Uh, our company makes art investable. So fine art paintings that are between $1 million and $30 million in size, we make them investable. We fractionalize the paintings. Uh, and the way that we are thinking about market volatility, to be quite honest, is that, if anything, it is more attractive a time to invest in art than it otherwise might be, which is already quite attractive to begin with. Um, Art as an asset class is not something that many investors have admittedly ever thought about. And so a lot of what I do in my role is sort of educational in nature to kind of introduce art as an asset class to the investor community for the first time. Um, the asset class itself, it's been appreciating at 14% annualized for several decades. Most people don't know this, the way that you might know what stocks have appreciated at, bonds, same idea. Um, and specifically during uh, periods of market turmoil, you know, one of the things I'll say about art, and I'll be open about this, is it's not necessarily the most liquid asset class, as you might imagine, but when we sometimes get the question, you know, how is the art market done at a particular point in time, it's not always the easiest to answer because you don't have a whole lot of real-time pricing. Nevertheless, we actually got lucky as a business in that this year, in the midst of market turmoil, when equities were falling and bonds were falling, you know what was happening right at the same time? Auction season in the art market. So it was among the more active periods of time for the art market. How did the art market do? Records were being broken left and right. So it's sort of a, a good way for us to point to a period of time that was very recent to say that the art market seems to have ignored in a lot of ways the market turmoil that's taken place. Um, I could go back in time further and tell you that the art market was positive in the year 2001, it was positive in 2008, it was positive in 2018, and it all sort of brings me back to, and sorry, by way of background, I spent my entire career in the traditional investment management world, so I have a little bit of a nerdy component to me. And what I find to be the most fascinating part about art as an asset class is that it has a correlation profile that I have never seen in my career. And if you'll permit me a moment to explain what I mean by that. So when I used to research every other asset class under the sun and build portfolios for institutions and many other types of investors, the one thing you learn when you look at the correlation profile of just about every asset class is that it usually is as follows. You pick an asset class and you like it because it has a low correlation to some other asset classes, but it's inevitably gonna have a higher correlation to other asset classes. It's just sort of the name of the game. That's the world of investments we have. What makes art so unique in terms of its correlation profile is that its correlation is close to zero relative to any asset class you measure it to, measure it up against. I did it relative to 15 major asset classes and I stopped at 15 because quite honestly, I got bored. I saw the same result over and over, near zero correlation. So we think it's attractive, not only in down markets where there's turmoil, but frankly, in, in most markets in general. So from art to a quantitative equity, uh, Dr. Sophie. Uh, quite Dan a jump, yes. quite a jump. <laughs> but some of what I'll say maybe will resonate given what we've discussed in the earlier panel and what Alan has discussed. I'm the head of quantitative equity at Lacaze, and uh, if we're thinking now about portfolio construction and what to do in volatile times, my argument, and maybe I'll be an agent provocateur at this stage, is that it's probably already too late. Um, typically, there are three ways in which you can hedge yourself or protect against these market downturns. One would be go to cash, deleverage. 
at the scale of a pension fund like Lacaise, which is 300 billion, it's impossible. Besides, we are paid to take risk on behalf of pensioners. They want us to beat actuarial rates for the long term. Um, the second one would be having defensive strategies, but that would be accessible only if you manage a cross-asset, multi-asset portfolio. And besides, it's like buying a, an umbrella in the middle of a storm on Times Square. You know, in the middle of a storm, basically the price goes to 20 bucks for an umbrella. So you need to have the structure, you need to have the what-if scenario in place before the storm hits, and that's the same for defensive strategies. So if you go into options, et cetera, et cetera, uh, you need to pay the carries. There's going to be negative carry across the board. You cannot go, just go short the market. You need to find more inventive solutions to have that. In my experience for long-term investors, which have their eyes fixed on the next 20 years, saying that we want to have defensive strategies or tail risk hedging usually is not a great conversation starter. Because the key focus will be, do I have enough dry powder to take opportunity, to, op to seize the opportunities right now, as opposed to deleverage or de-risk or go into defensive strategy? And the third one would be diversification, the good old free lunch of finance. And of course, as we know, all the correlations are positive these days. So these three tools, actually, to protect yourself in these turbulent times may or may not be available. In my case, they are not available. So the best thing we can do, really, is to try to do the best we can estimating risk, estimating correlations, and stay about as anchored on the benchmarks as we possibly can. So to take very measured active risks. But apart from that, there's not much we can do. And I, I will argue that now is not the time to test these things. We need to have simulated and handled these type of cases a while before. Okay, so it needs to be part of the investment process and there needs to be a plan. Are there certain measured risks or inventive steps that are especially att attractive for you right now? Risk uh, areas which are attractive right yes. now? Um, it used to be the case that alternative investments, liquid oils, also was a conversation non-starter because compared to risky markets, beta-driven markets, then uh, the conversation could not go very far. Uh, the returns were just not the, up there. But we've seen some uh, long short funds or even equity funds are doing extremely well in this environment. CTAs have been doing extremely well. So what I do see, even though I may not be sitting in that area, is renewed interest in the diversification properties of these uh, assets. Hugh, let's uh, bring you in on life settlements and uh, how you're thinking through constructing those portfolios in this time. Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, and I think uh, Alan did a fantastic job if you just insert life insurance as opposed to art. Um, it's another extremely uncorrelated asset class. I think um, there's two really good academic studies out there that I've seen, they're a little dated, but the correlation is somewhere between negative 0.12 and 0 0.06. Um, to capital markets, so about as uncorrelated as it comes. Um, our view of risk is, is very much different than I think most, uh, most other people's view of risk here. Uh, we think about risk in terms of impairment, that is, what kind of disease the underlying insured that we are purchasing the policy from has. Um, you know, we do kind of care about what the capital markets uh, are doing, only in that as interest rates have decreased over time, we have not seen in lockstep, but in tandem, we have seen the discount rate at which we can apply to purchasing valuations compress as well. So the expectation is, is that as you know, we get tighter fiscal and monetary policy, we will see the ability for investors to realize larger and larger returns uh, come to fruition. Um, additionally, in this market environment, you know, kind of more broadly thinking about your all's portfolio construction, um, you know, the uh, the imbalance that this market creates for us is, as in, whether it's inflationary pressures or recessionary press pressures, people will turn to alternative asset class, whether it's art, uh, private real estate, um, or life insurance policies, which will only increase supply, um, thus increasing the spread that we can, we can realize for our investors' returns. Um, but going back to kind of the risks that we care about, right? So our largest risk that we, you know, that we think about that keeps us up at night is really twofold. So in the insurance policy marketplace, uh, 
policies have, and this is a terrible pun, so please excuse me, but a drop dead date. Um, that is the date where if the insured lives past, the policy just lapses. That's in, in not just term contracts, that's in universal and whole as well. Um, so we, we very much care about that because we view that as a risk that we can absolutely control. Uh, another risk that we think about quite, about quite a lot is diversification across carrier. Right? We don't want to be overexposed to any one carrier, although I, I don't think an insurance company in history has ever defaulted on a payment because of the nature of their general account and also the nature of the state insurance that backs them up. Unnecessary to, to play in that risk. And then the more important risk, and this is the underwriting risk that we care about, um, has to do with that impairment, that disease. Right. So the risks that we don't like are risks that have binary events. Think liver transplant. For us, if we invest in somebody who has a liver transplant, when, th when we're looking at their medical records, they might look terminally ill, but a year later, they get a liver transplant and their life goes from a life expectancy of two years to eight years. That is phenomenal for them. We're very happy for them, but as an investor, that is something that we don't want to get involved in. Um, and there's other kind of uh, things that work invest against investors in the asset class, but in uh, an attempt to be brief uh, and make sure that you all get to cocktails on time. I'll, I'll stop there and maybe answer those questions later. Thanks. Um, and Peter, as you look through credit investing, what are you guys doing over at Exonic um, as you think through what you're expecting ahead in the market? Sure, thank you. I'm going to pick up on some points uh, from each of my fellow panelists here, I think. Um, maybe that's why you put me last. Uh, but, but I agree with Sophie uh, in that uh, there are really three principal ways within any kind of strategy that you can um, manage volatility. You can go to cash, you can position your portfolio, and you ought to try to do that in advance of the volatility as, a, as opposed to in reaction to it. Um, and you can try to invest in idiosyncratic kinds of investments as part of that second part. And then lastly, you can try to engage in convexity hedging uh, typically in using some form of a derivative. So Axonic is a $5 billion credit fund, multi-asset credit fund, uh, with uh, really our heartbeat is in structured products. Um, but one of the things I do there is I'm directly involved in trying to hedge our more liquid book um, and also make sure that our portfolio is positioned uh, with the CIO team uh, in a way that can weather this kind of market. Now, in terms of that second piece, which is trying to get ahead of the volatility, our view from, I would say, probably mid-year last year was that inflation was not transitory and that a Fed pivot would be uh, required at some point in time. So I remember the July meeting. I was sitting on the beach. I was listening to the, to the chairman and thinking he's in complete denial. So, you know, fast forward, of course, the pivot happened. Uh, the big rates move happened late last year. What did we do? We had already begun to position towards cash. We do have a small equity book. We shrank that. Um, we kept our duration incredibly short. Uh, we made sure that anything we didn't love, we didn't own, which is part of the cash piece. And we began uh, engaging in convexity hedging uh, towards the end of the year, which actually ended up timing quite well relative to, to uh, the performance of equities. We used equity volatility. We used credit volatility. Uh, and a number of other strategies as well. And in, in addition to that, we hedge duration using interest rate swaps and swaptions. So there are a number of things that you can do in this market, but I think you really need to start with what sometimes is a contrarian fundamental thesis about the state of the world. A lot of people got caught off guard. And then I think perhaps the most important piece really for us, we do some, uniquely, some, some unique things within structured products real estate. For example, we have a long-standing relationship with F Freddie Mac where we provide workforce housing loans through B pieces in the securitization. Um, and we very much like multifamily uh, housing right now, in fact, as, at least for now, a hedge to both inflation and the recession because it is defensive positioning by definition. Um, but also because there is an interesting structural uh, dynamic going on in the housing market right now. Housing is as unaffordable as it was in 2007, especially now that 30-year mortgage rates are closing in on 6%. So rents are likely to rise, and as a result, cap rates for multifamily, while 
they will likely rise somewhat with higher interest rates, um, will likely not rise all that much. So cash, portfolio positioning, convexity hedging, and making sure you try to construct a portfolio that is not beta, but alpha. That last part is not easy. No, excellent, excellent points. Um, one of the um, key issues that we, you know, we've, we've been reporting a lot of is uh, markdowns and the illiquidity factor, and especially given public market comparables, what that means for more illiquid investments. So I wanted to ask um, about the art market. Does that same thesis sort of apply to art when, it, when you look at illiquidity and valuations these days? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> with the art market, as you can imagine, it's a little bit more nuanced than for other asset classes. Um, we've actually, I mean, this, this is taking us back to the early days in Masterworks history. One of the first projects we had was actually building uh, an extraordinary database of all the art market transactions that have ever taken place going back 70 years. Uh, there were several dozen analysts who probably didn't have necessarily the most exciting job, but it was basically to go through thousands of auction catalogs. Many of them were in paper format, and their job was to take all the transactions that have taken place and put them into a giant database. So we've since built kind of the industry-leading database for all information about the art market, um, but we're also constantly adding to that database in real time. And the way we're doing it is because we have become what we believe is uh, the biggest art buyer in the art market, it's hard to prove definitively, but we're quite confident we are the biggest in the, uh, in the market. Um, what ends up happening now is we have a lot of collectors and institutions who actually come to us and they offer to sell us their art. And each one of those data points actually is extraordinarily valuable because once they come to us, we now know who it is, we know what art they own, and we know how much they want to sell it to us for. So we basically have constantly updated real-time pricing for a whole lot of art that's available globally in the market. Most of the time, just as a side note, we don't actually buy the art because we have stringent parameters around what we're willing to buy and what we're not, but that data gets added to our database. So for valuing the artworks that we own, we do it on a quarterly basis. Um, and it's sort of an interesting thing. There's some element of irony here, but I, I can't help but point it out. You know, for our investors, we know that it brings a lot of peace of mind and trust to tell them that, yes, we do have external valuations, and we do. But if you also take a step back and think about everything I just said about this extraordinary database that we've built, we would argue that our valuation methodology is significantly more accurate than any other third party that might come in and value our art. So nevertheless, yes, we do have external parties that value our art, although we think our valuations are a lot more accurate. Um, in terms of you know, recent history, how have our paintings been doing? Um, I kind of alluded to this in my opening remarks. Uh, the art market basically beats to its own drum. Um, it's, uh, it hasn't really been that impacted by market volatility. In fact, if anything, the art market is up a few percentage points this year despite everything else that's happened in the market. Um, and you know, just as, again, another side note, uh, so we've, we've brought 120 paintings to market worth $500 million since our founding. Um, I believe the weakest performer, and I'm doing this off of memory, I believe the weakest performer uh, with updated pricing is down 10%. I think the strongest is up 80%. So yes, we do have regular valuations, and it does not seem like recent market volatility has had much, uh, much of an impact on the art market. And when it comes to real estate and life settlements, how do you think through that factor? Yeah, I mean, you know, in, in fact, in, market like, in markets like this, um, if you can have a long-term committed source of capital, these kinds of markets are perfect for us. You know, we, we're raising a private fund, and in fact, uh, our, uh, our master fund is, is actually up year to date, um, despite the market volatility for a bunch of the reasons I mentioned earlier, but private credit for us right now is um, a big focus. Uh, that is where we can take advantage of unnatural selling in public markets, for example, or even in private markets, and look for opportunities that we really haven't seen for a very, very long time. There's been a tremendous amount of monetary policy stimulus, uh, the fiscal policy stimulus, uh, in combination with that monetary policy, policy stimulus, let's just be honest, 
that's what sets the tone for something like Bitcoin. I know there were a lot of crypto panels earlier, so hopefully everybody's gone. But when you're talking about cash flowing hard assets or in art, for example, true scarcity value, genius in art is not the same as a fungible token. It's, it's, that's manufactured scarcity. Uh, a Monet, okay, that's it. A, a piece of property in a uniquely situated location that our team can identify and, and identify the cash flows and the risk profile of that property, you know, ve very different than a speculative equity or a cryptocurrency. Uh, yeah, I mean, as it relates to our portfolio, you know, our valuation metrics are not based on capital markets, right? We're co our correlation is to mortality rates. So our valuation policy is based on the Society of Actuaries VBT tables, which gets updated on a three to five year schedule. So from a portfolio perspective, we don't, I mean, we do evaluation on a quarterly basis. Because of the actuarial math, it can get very complex, but generally speaking, market, -like, market events like these don't have a direct effect on you know, our, the, our valuation and how the valuation is calculated. So in our asset class, what's very important is to actually dig into that valuation metric and understand what, what discount they're applying to the VBT tables and the actuarial math that they're, that they're using to calculate um, life expectancy because that's how our portfolios are valued. As it relates to the broader markets and what's going on, you know, I would agree that this is a, um, a buying opportunity for the asset class in general because of all the things that I you know, touched on in, in the first part of what I said. You know, as, as we get inflationary or recessionary pressures, people are going to look to sell, sell assets, um, which means the supply and demand imbalance will create great buying opportunities. Additionally, I mean, if you think for no, no other reason than we've seen, you know, what, what is it, uh, 175 basis point raise in, or what, maybe be at 350, somebody said, by the end of, the, end of this year. Um, you know, if you're buying a levered portfolio, which we don't do, and your target is 15, and your cost of capital just tripled, you're, you're going to be more discerning about how you're deploying that capital. So your, your, your purchasing rate's going to go up. So that's all to the benefit of investors in the space, I think, over the next three to five years. You know, I, I didn't mean to skirt the, the, the valuation part of the call. I got so excited about the opportunity, <laughs> I didn't talk about valuation. I, I mean, you know, look, uh, we, many of us in this room have lived through 2008, and correlation events are correlation events, and, and it's hard when public markets are selling off for private valuations not to be marked down. They, they, they need to be. Um, different parts of our portfolio are, are valued in different ways. We do have QCIP bonds that trade pretty liquidly. In the private parts of the portfolio, um, there's, we're obviously looking at the universe of real estate to see how to value our portfolio on a model basis, but with an eye towards what's going on in the public markets, because while a public market sell-off might create opportunity, you know, it's, not, it's disingenuous if you, if you try to tell yourself or your investors that private market valuations aren't affected because they typically will be, but that private capital gives you the ability to ride out that storm and take advantage of the opportunities. That's the important point, I think. Um, and Dr. Ansofi, so your focus is on quantitative equity, and as you think through building models, um, how do you think about structuring them these days, given after the pandemic, or during the pandemic, so many quant equity funds struggled because the models hadn't taken into account, into account a uh, once in a lifetime nation, you know, worldwide pandemic. So um, how do you try to resolve that now as you look, think through quantitative equities and modeling during this time? That's a very difficult question because the, um, the pandemic was a totally external shock. Uh, the duration of the crisis event was short the time to recovery was extremely short as well. Um, so for a traditional quantitative equity shop where you have a number of traditional factors, my argument is it's impossible to adapt and then to get out of it. Um, the only thing that could have been done is if to go back on, to go back to the earlier panel on the usage of alternative data, there had been some sort of a switch or a combination of indicators so that emphasis could have been put suddenly on shorter term factors or on these alternative data sets that would have given a totally different answers to these uh, traditional factors. So every crisis is different. 
uh, all we know is that the symptoms are always going to be the same. You know, there's a, when there's a flight to safety, um, repricing of assets, correlations jumping to one, uh, but the duration and the depth is going to be different. So it, it was not a 2008 event. Um, my take on it is that for people who will not have a discretionary switch, which most of us cannot because that's not the discipline we're into, the best thing was to stay the course, keep, keep, keep our calm, and just stick to the game, literally. And the other hat you wear is helping with asset allocation. And so when you think of a pension that's $300 billion big, what, um, that's a very big ship to move. Um, how do you think through asset allocation to, let's say, hedge funds and private equity and other types of alternative asset management during this time, moving, uh, pivoting a ship that big? Again, it would be impossible to steer a tanker in the middle of a storm. Uh, and there's no single decision, let's say, a one billion or even two billion allocation that's going to move the needle in any given direction. So the focus that we have is not so much the next six months, it's the next five to ten years. So that may be a bit shocking because all of us have a finance background. So we do know that if we are the 100, there's a 20% loss, right? We're at 80. To go back, if we get another 20%, we're at 96. If we had found a magic bullet or a way to cut this loss, we would be at 120. So the magic way is really to cut risk and to live through and to, to, to prevent these, these, these tail risks from happening, but it's not the case. What we did see in this environment is a focus on the longer term decisions that will help the resiliency of the fund at the 320 billion scale. So what would that be? Increase the duration of the assets. Why? Because fixed income, while it may not be the diversification buffer we've expected in the past, nevertheless, um, is related to liquidity and all, also to the way that we can meet the needs of investors, of depositors. Now, on an LDI, so liability-driven investment basis, there is a need to match the duration. So we need to be increased, and we increased it, roughly speaking, 10 years. And this is complete. On the equity side, it's to avoid the factor biases. Uh, in other words, saying that we invest in quality, growth, or value, but on the discretionary side, having lots of biases, which precisely during volatile times may play games. So it's about bridging these gaps, filling these gaps, uh, sometimes with systematic allocation, in order to leave the discretionary managers the latitude really to focus on stock picking bets and conviction bets. In real estate, it's about um, going into more logistics or different segments, not being as much in malls and commercial. And these are long-ranging issues that may help the fund for the next five to 20 years. So it takes time to make these decisions. And typically, they are not driven just by consideration of the next six months or one year. Um, let's talk about some of the biggest risks that are um, facing your specific areas. Um, why don't we start with art? What is the biggest concern, the biggest risk to investing in art? So um, in terms of risks, I think the risks in art are pretty much the same no matter what the environment is. And the risk is as follows. If you want to sell an expensive piece of art right now, you will not be likely to get the exact price for it that you want to get. It's that simple. At the same time, so the segment of the art market that we focus on, by the way, so it's what we call blue chip artists whose paintings sell for one to $30 million. They're artists with names like Warhol and Basquiat. I can name a whole bunch more. Um, but it is one of those things where, you know, on the flip side, you can't help but think to yourself, what really is the risk inherent in something, let's say, like a Picasso? Like, would you really expect that tomorrow or a year from now or three years from now, you're gonna wake up to find out that your Picasso is worth 50% less or worth nothing? That is not very likely to be the case. Obviously, you can't guarantee anything, but it just seems very unlikely. So the biggest risk in art is if you want to sell it right now, you will probably have a bit of a hard time selling it. That's the biggest risk. And what about life settlements? Yeah, I mean, Alan's doing my job for me up here. Uh, 
Yeah, the, the life settlement market is um, is very lumpy, and it's lumpy on a monthly basis. So um, in a closed-end strategy, uh, we're a little less concerned about the liquid, you know, quote-unquote liquidity premium. And I think it's important to touch on that because all of us up here have probably had investors you know, bring up liquidity premium as a reason to not invest in our strategy. And I think it's really, really overstated because every asset class has a liquidity premium when you want to go and try and sell it. Right? I mean, generally speaking, you're not selling asset classes or assets uh, that are doing exceptionally well unless you're pairing them back. So you're not really selling them. You're just bringing them back a little bit. Um, but so anyway, you know, that, that is the, the issue that we run into. And that's why we, we run um, closed end strategies so that our investors kind of don't trip over themselves because of the valuation being updated because the BBT tables got updated or because of some existential, sh existential shock that really doesn't have an impact on the portfolio. Um, you know, there are some players in the space that have run open-ended strategies and really run into some trouble doing this because the mismatch between duration and, you know, whatever your t liquidity terms can really foul you up. Um, but, you know, really the, the thing that keeps us up at night is our underwriting risk, right? We are always asking the question, how can we underwrite a life better? How can we become more accurate in predicting life expectancy? Because the more accurate we are there, the less we're going to pay for a policy up front, the less we're going to pay to finance that policy over the life of it, the, you know, the hold period for us, and the better our uh, returns are going to be for our investors. And in the credit universe? Well, we, we, <clears throat> what um, the founder of our firm likes to say, Clayton DiGiacinto, he likes to say that he doesn't really worry about our underwriting because we do it so well. Um, of course, that's what he's going to say. And, I, and, I, and, we, and, and we believe that it is what we do well. We analyze idiosyncratic risks well, especially in real estate and the other areas that we play. What keeps me up at night being the guy who manages the risk mitigation strategies um, is precisely what we are all reading about in the headlines. And it's something that um, actually took a little bit longer to occur than I thought it might. But the way I think about it is really we, we are witnessing a secular change rather than just a cyc cyclical one. And what I mean by that is we've had, uh, since Chairman Volcker hiked rates um, in the early 80s, um, subsequently to, to cut them for 40 plus years, we have the end of a secular bond bull market, said differently, the end of falling interest rates to the zero bound. So zero interest rate policy took us to the netherworld, so to speak, and the netherworld in Europe in particular. And, and I do worry about all of the negatively yielding debt that is sitting at, on bank balance sheets in Europe, quite frankly. And there's a reason why uh, Madame Lagarde uh, started talking about emergency policies. I'm, sure, I'm certain you have a, a more well-informed view than I. But, but I worry about, from a more conceptual standpoint, I worry about this generational end of the bond bull market. And I think investors need to change the way they think about investing from, you know, um, everybody's smart uncle who wasn't so smart, but just because he was a baby boomer and he got in the market in the 1970s, he made a lot of money. I think those days, frankly, are likely in the rearview mirror. And I think the answer for some might be to move to a Warren Mosler-like world of MMT. Stephanie Kelton is better known for MMT than Warren Mosler, but he's the father of MMT. And I don't think that's a very good answer either because we can see to some extent, and it supply chain, we could have a long conversations on why we have inflation. It's very unusual and usually happens in times of war. But the point is, is that fiscal stimulus in the United States in particular did play a role. So, we're a little bit, we're in a little bit of a policy quandary at the moment. What happens when we go into uh, the next recession? Uh, and frankly, I don't think the Fed is going to get to its terminal rate. Uh, I don't think it's going to be able to before the markets tighten financial conditions for it. Not unlike what happened in 2018, if we remember what happened. Chairman Powell talked in a, a press conference in December and said, we're on autopilot relative to QT. Uh, the market said, no, no, you're not. Um, Equity sold off 20% with a much different and more robust backdrop than we have today. The yield curve inverted, the Fed cut, 
and we found ourselves back at the zero bound. So even if we get to 3% on Fed funds from here, which again, I don't think is likely, usually it takes five to 7% worth of cuts to take us out of a recession. So I, that's what worries me most, is that we had a valuation bubble coming into this, and there's not a ton that policymakers can do relative to history that can, that can pull us out. So when it comes to asset allocation, what weighs on you the most? What is the biggest worry and risk that you see when it comes to you know, allocating the billions and billions of dollars that you're doing? Two things. The, one, the first one will be uh, the recession risk, which has increased markedly over the last few weeks. And here there is the risk that uh, the action of the central banks will be leading to a vast overshoot and that therefore it's going to accelerate the path to recession. A few weeks ago we were talking about soft landing. Uh, I think that this risk has receded and we're going towards something which may be a bit more brutal than that. Um, I'm not dealing with macroeconomics directly because I'm in quant equities, so I'm worried about the repercussions of this protracted scenario. What we do see in times of uncertainty as opposed to times of risk is typically factor reversal. In other words, things which we had seen work for 20 years or 15 years no longer work and we don't really have an historical perspective actually to test it. Or we think, oh, that's okay, in back tests we can live through that. We've seen this already since the beginning of the year with uh, value vastly outperforming growth, for instance. We've seen in certain factors with um, the intuition no longer working, i.e. profitable, growish company getting pummeled. Uh, for me, that impacts the models, it impacts the factors, it impacts the signals, and ultimately it has a big impact on the performance. So this protracted scenario of upheaval worries me, yes. And, and I almost, just to, just to pick up on that, do we have time for me to just, oh, yeah. yeah, pick up on that? Yeah. Um, I've, in my comment, I almost took recession as a given. And you were a bit more diplomatic and euphemistic in saying that you thought a soft landing would be difficult to avoid. I take it as a compliment. No one ever said I was diplomatic. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Rel relative to what I'm about to say, um, I think you were. Um, but but you know I, I, I really we, we had I'm I'm going to be I'm going to be critical of, of of the Fed and and by implication other simple central banks by saying the Fed was slow to react and it is to Sophie's point um, very likely it seems especially when you take into account Waller's comments of of Saturday or whenever it was they're likely to overreact um, and that's problematic because markets have actually tightened quite a bit already um, so you don't fix a mistake that you can't even admit to by making an even bigger mistake the other direction. And that's, that's my nearer term worry within the context of this bigger picture worry because I'm assuming a recession is gonna happen. Then once it happens, what are they gonna do? No, absolutely. Um, when it comes to the flip side, which is the opportunity, is there a very specific area of your universes that you're particularly bullish on? like some little subsect of art or some little corner of life science, uh, sorry, life settlements um, and credit and some specific, very specific space that uh, you see an opportunity Should in. Should I go first? Yes, go ahead. Um, so I'm gonna cheat a little with my answer. Um, I would answer that question in two ways. Uh, the first is to say, I don't think I mentioned this in my opening remarks, um, the asset class itself is $1.7 trillion in size. And just to give that a little bit of context, the US private equity industry is $3.4 trillion in size. I think everyone generally agrees nowadays that the private equity industry is enormous. So I would argue that if you have an asset class that's $1.7 trillion, which is half the size of private equity, it too qualifies as being enormous. And in terms of competitors, at the moment, we don't have any. And so this is sort of my cheating answer by saying, when you are the sole firm operating in a $1.7 trillion asset class, and you've built a proprietary database that financial institutions are using, at least their surface-level surface data that we're willing to provide them, 
uh, when you have that database to make investment decisions, you basically see opportunities all over the place that nobody else is seeing by definition. So that's my cheating answer, that we are constantly seeing very attractive investment opportunities. Uh, the other part of my answer I'll give, which I guess is also sort of cheating, if I had to be honest, um, we are going to be uh, in market in short order uh, with a liquid strategy, a liquid diversified strategy. It's going to be more evergreen in nature. Um, and so for us, of course, that's something that we're particularly proud of, that we're going to be able to offer institutional investors access to art as an asset class in a diversified format with some levels of liquidity as well. So sorry for cheating twice. Um, sure, I'll go next. Uh, as, it, as it relates to life settlements, um, I'm, I've worked in a number of different asset classes in banking, and uh, I have to say that this is probably one of the more exciting asset classes, as sleepy as it is. Um, so our industry, um, you know, people like me, institutional buyers, we represent a static $25 billion in face value. The average annual estimated transactability is $225 billion. So there's just massive amounts to grow. That means on an annual basis, $225 billion in value disappears because it lapses. That's pretty staggering. And the, you know we can get into this and maybe over a cocktail or two as to why that happens, but the asset class has gone through fits and starts over the years. Um, where River Rock sits, where the, the area of the market that we occupy is small face. To us, that means we don't purchase policies with a face value greater than two and a half million dollars. And the reality is the majority of the purchases we make are gonna be between $100,000 and a million dollars. We do this, um, and I'll give you the diplomatic answer and then I'll dive a little deeper, is we take advantage of natural socioeconomic trends that exist in the market today. What I mean by this, and this is where the asset class can get a little bit morbid, is the wealth effect is real. Everybody in this room knows this, it's documented. Wealthier people live longer. The Society of Actuaries has actually put out a table that shows that the demographic that we, we purchase in, on average, die 4% earlier than their calculated life expectancy. If you then go up to the next demographic, the two and a half to five million range, they live 10% longer. So, the, you know, again, this is a little bit morbid, um, but from an investment perspective, we want to be in the area of the market where we have these natural tailwinds. Um, that does capacity constrain us, for sure. Think of us like the micro cap as opposed to the uh, larger mega cap funds. Um, but that is the area of the market that we occupy. That's, that's, you know, there's a handful of players in the space. We're one of them. And we've carved out this niche and um, believe that that's the best place to allocate capital. Um, <clears throat> where to start? Um, ag again, this volatile environment provides, I think, significant opportunity. Um, we continue to like, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, multifamily uh, for some structural reasons, um, but also because it tends to be a very stable and defensive asset class. We like the opportunities we're, we think we're going to see in something called the SASB market, single asset, single borrower. That's exactly what it sounds uh, like. Um, we have the relationships and the analytical firepower to comb through those in a way a lot of other structured product firms do not. They tend to be new issue conduit borrows, borrowers. That's not what we do. We are asset specific specialists. We're looking for cash flow for a value at, at, a, at a value. Um, I could go on and on. I will say this, we do have an interval fund which um, we are in the process of raising right now, which can give uh, investors, it has a ticker. Um, I don't know if I can say what it is, so I won't, but uh, that gives investors, uh, public investors, access to the asset classes in which we invest. And when it comes to um, opportunity as you look to allocate to different funds, you mentioned that you liked long short equity which is really interesting because there are so many long short equity managers that are struggling right now. Is that the area that, that you see the most opportunity? Are there others when you look to how, where you want to put your money right now? I also manage not, I manage not only internal strategies but also external strategies. So I have a small allocation to hedge funds in that space. Mm -hmm. um, we do see renewed interest in that area. Why? Because in the current environment, some people 
who were mitigating or controlling certain exposures actually have done extremely well since the beginning of the year. And comparison, of course, is always relative. So when traditional markets tank, anything that is flattish or 5% up looks like the new 25%, right? Um, CTAs, commodity strategies also, uh, are uh, of interest. CTAs maybe more than commodity funds. Why? Because we sit in Canada. It's a very cyclical economy. And the one thing is that we have to pile commodities on top of commodities. So um, commodities tend to be a conversation non-starter uh, up north. Excellent. I think we've covered a fair bit of ground. Um, and I wanted to thank you all for your time. Thank our audience for their time. Um, we are the only thing between us and cocktails, so I will let <laughs> everyone um, enjoy the rest of the reception. And thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you.